Welcome to Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. On Snoozecast, we read excerpts from public domain works and occasionally original stories. Listen to us on snoozecast.com, like our Facebook page, and follow us on Instagram. We'd like to thank our listeners. If you enjoy our show, please write us a review on Apple Podcasts, and also share it with a friend. This episode is brought to you by Crinkly Leaves. Tonight, we'll be reading the opening to The Study of Plant Life by M.C. Stopes, published in 1910. M.C. Stopes short for Marie Charlotte, who lived from 1880 to 1958, was a British author, paleobotanist, and women's rights campaigner. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. The Life of a Plant, Chapter 1 Many people do not realize that plants are alive. This mistake is due to the fact that plants are not so noisy and quick in their ways as animals, and therefore do not attract so much attention to themselves, their lives, and their occupations. When we look at a sunflower, surrounded by its leaves and standing still and upright in the sunlight, We do not realize at first that it is doing work. We do not connect the idea of work with such a thing of beauty. But look on it as we should on a picture or a statue. Yet all the time that plant is not only living its own life, but is doing work of a kind which animals cannot do. Its green leaves in the light are manufacturing food for the whole plant out of such simple materials that an animal could not use them at all as food. Even its beautiful flower is creating and building up the seeds which will form the sunflowers of the future. All animals directly or indirectly make use of the work done by plants in manufacturing food, for they either live on plants themselves or eat other animals which do so. Plants are living and therefore require food of some kind as well as air and water in the same way and for the same purposes as do animals. As a rule, we cannot see them breathing and eating, but that is because we do not look in the right way. In our study of plants, we must first learn how to see and question them properly, and when we have done this, they will show themselves to us and tell us stories of their lives which are quite as interesting as any animal stories. Now the sunflower we have just thought of is probably growing in a garden well looked after by a gardener, who sees that it gets all the light and water and just the kind of soil it needs. It is therefore protected and cared for to a certain extent. But who looks after the wild plants which manage to grow everywhere? 
These have not only their own lives to live, but by their own efforts must overcome difficulties which are not even felt by the cultivated ones. They succeed in a wonderful way, and some plants manage to grow under very difficult conditions, even in places where they get no water for months under a burning sun, or in forests where the overshadowing trees cut off the light and rain, or under the water where they get no direct air. They have to do all the usual work of plants, and at the same time struggle against the hardships of their surroundings. They are like men fighting for their lives with one hand and doing a piece of work with the other. The result of this is that they sometimes make themselves strange-looking objects, and in some plants, which have had a very hard struggle, it is difficult to know which part of the plant is which. Look, for example, at a cactus, which grows in the desert. It appears to have neither stem nor leaves like an ordinary plant, and to consist merely of a roundish green mass covered with needle-like prickles. Yet when you come to study the cactus, you will find out that the thick, fleshy mass is really its stem, and the prickles its leaves which have taken on these strange shapes. By means of its unusual form, the cactus can live where our common plants would die of the dry heat in a day or two. The power plants have of changing their bodies so as to fit themselves to live under all kinds of conditions is one of the strongest proofs that they are alive. All the parts of plants have some special life work, just as we have legs and arms for different purposes. And every part is formed in some way to suit the needs of the plant and help it to get on well in its home. The main thing to realize at the beginning of the study of plants is that they are living things and therefore to try to discover the importance of the shape and arrangement of all their parts and their relation to the life of each plant as a whole. We will begin by looking carefully for all the signs of life in them and noting how often these are the same as those of the animals, even though the whole plant body is so different from that of an animal. Chapter 2. Signs of Life If you were asked to give the signs of life in an animal, it is likely that you would think at once of its power of breathing, eating, growing, and moving. Now, when we ask the same question about plants, the answer does not appear to be quite so easy to find. Because at first sight, plants do not seem to do any of these things except the growing. However, the same answer would be quite correct for plants as well as animals, for they are really able to breathe, eat, grow, and move. All you have to do is watch them in the right way to see that this is the case. We're not in the habit of treating dry seeds as though they were alive. Beans are stored away in sacks all the winter and may be left for months in dry cellars, and the precious seeds which will give us our beautiful flowers in the summer are put away in boxes through the winter. 
Yet you know that if you place seeds in the earth and keep them warm and moist, little plants will come up and grow. What gives them the power of growth, which is not possessed by the stones and earth around them? Warmth and moisture alone could not put this power into the seeds when we planted them. This power, which only belongs to living things, was there all the time, but was lying asleep, shut in and protected so that it was not easily disturbed till suitable conditions made it time for it to wake. You know when you are asleep that you do not eat or run about, but simply lie still and breathe. This is what the seed was doing before the baby plant began to break through its protecting coat and show itself to the world as a living thing. Let us watch some of these young plants just waking up to activity and see if we can find in them the four signs we take as being the tests of animal life. You know that when you breathe, you take air into your lungs, use some of it, and give the rest out. You can show that plants also use up some part of the air. If you would actually prove this to yourself or anyone else, take some peas or beans, soak them in water, and leave them in damp sawdust for a day or two till the tiny plant has just begun to show. Then put them on wet blotting paper in a jar which has a very well-fitting cork with no leakage and through which a fine bent glass tube is fitted. Place a small tube of caustic potash in the jar. Then place the end of the bent tube in a dish of water, which acts better if you have dissolved some caustic potash in it. Once it has begun to rise in the tube, mark the level of the water with a small label. If then you mark it daily, the labels will show how much water has risen each day, and the amount of water rising in the tube shows us the amount of air which has been absorbed by the growing beans. This tells us, therefore, that air is absorbed by plants in the course of their growth. But there is another thing we must notice about breathing, which is equally important. You will find that you yourself, as well as all animals, not only use up a part of the air, but also give out a waste product, which we call carbonic acid gas. You can see one of the characters of this gas from your lungs if you take a jar of lime water and breathe into it for some time. Compare this with a similar jar of lime water through which ordinary air has been pumped at about the same rate for the same time, and you will see that the one you have breathed into has gone very much more cloudy white than the other. The cloudiness in the first jar is caused by the waste gas, carbonic acid, which you breathed out and which combines with the lime in the lime water to make solid grains of chalk. Fine white chalk grains always form in lime water when this gas is present so that a jar of clear lime water is a very good test for the presence of the gas. Now to go to the other signs of life. I think you will hardly need to do any special experiment to show that seedlings grow into big plants 
You must have seen it so often for yourself in the woods and fields and gardens. We have still to show that plants eat and move, but before we can do this properly, we must learn a little more about the parts of the bodies of the plants themselves, for they have quite a different set of organs to those we are accustomed to in animals and their way of eating is so different from that of animals that we cannot understand it immediately. Chapter 3. Seeds and Seedlings If we wish to follow the whole life of a plant, we cannot do better than begin by watching the baby plant hatching out of its seed at the beginning of its active life. There are many seeds which would be good to begin work on. Any kind would be interesting, but it is best to use some nice big ones which allow us to see the parts easily. Good ones to choose would be broad beans or peas. Notice first the size and shape of the dry seed of the bean. Make a drawing of it and then place it in water. After a few hours, you will see that the outside skin wrinkles up. This is because the skin absorbs water and increases in size, and so becomes too big for the rest of the seed. After the water has soaked right into the substance of the seed, you will find that the outer skin fits again and is once more smooth, and that the whole seed is larger than it was before it was soaked. Take one of these soaked beans and examine its structure. Notice the black mark where it was attached to the parent pod, and the little triangular ridge pointing towards it. Now, Carefully peel off the skin, noticing that there are two skins, an outer thick one and an inner thin one, which protect the parts within. When you have removed the skin, you will find that the inner portions of the seed split very readily into two thick, fleshy parts, and that lying between them is a tiny young plant. Notice how this young plant is connected on either side with the fleshy parts so that to separate them you must tear one side or the other. The two big fleshy parts are really portions of the young plant and are in fact its two first leaves but they are very different from ordinary leaves and are packed with food substances and are called the cotyledons or nurse leaves. Notice also the tiny root of the baby plant or embryo as it is called. It bends a little to the outer side and fits into a kind of pocket in the skin of the coat. You can see the shape of the root even from the outside of the dry bean. You will find in the pea, cucumber, and many other seeds that there is also the tiny embryo with its two nurse leaves, the whole being protected by strong coats. The differences between the bean, pea, and cucumber seeds are only in the details of shape and color, not in the actual parts of the seed. In the case of maize and corn, however, you will find that the seed does not split into two equal parts like the bean but that the young plant lies at one side of the seed 
and a solid white mass fills the rest of the space. There are also differences in the seedlings, which you will notice when they begin to grow. Now that you have examined some seeds, you should start a number growing so as to have plenty to watch. They will grow more quickly if you soak them in water for a night before you plant them in damp sawdust and keep them moist and fairly warm all the time. You should have a number of seeds of each kind planted together to provide enough for you to dig up one of them every day and examine it fully inside as well as out. Make a drawing of each one so that you will have a complete series of drawings showing how the young plants grow. As the young plant grows, notice how it breaks away from the protection of its nurse leaves. First, the root comes out and bends downwards into the sawdust. Then the little shoot, which bends up into the air. Whichever way you plant the seeds, you will find this is always the case. For even if you start with the root pointing up, it will bend round and grow downwards while the shoot bends up. As the plant gets bigger, side roots grow out from the main one, and the little leaves of the shoot begin to open out. The whole plant is growing. Now, we may perhaps begin to find out something about the question of feeding in plants. What are the nurse leaves doing all the time the plant is growing? You will find in the bean that the seed coats may split open a little, but that on the whole, the cotyledons remain all the time enclosed in them and attached to the young shoot. Examine the nurse leaves of seedlings of different ages and you will see that they are much less thick and fleshy in the older seedlings. As the plant gets bigger, the nurse leaves get thinner and less until they become merely dry, shriveled remnants. Now, what use could the cotyledons be if they only shrivel away? Take a freshly soaked seed and cut a thin slice of the nurse leaves and drop it into a little solution of iodine. The tissue will go violet blue color. Then drop iodine on a piece of bread, a piece of potato, and some boiled rice. And you will find that they also go blue or almost black. The food in the nurse leaves is in some ways the same as that in bread, potato, and rice, and in many other things we eat. The part of the food which goes blue with iodine is starch, and this blue coloring of starch with iodine is an easy and safe test for it. You will see the same color if you take some ordinary laundry starch and stir it up with hot water and a little iodine. Look now at the corn seed. The white solid mass in the seed contains starch, as you can prove with iodine. And although it is not in the cotyledon, yet it is quite near the young plant which can get at it easily. We have found, therefore, that young plants have a store of food in their nurse leaves 
or near them in the seed, and that this food is the same as very much of our own food. That is, it is a starch. There are other food substances present too, but they are more difficult to find. The seed, therefore, contains not only the young living plant itself, but also a storehouse of food for its use. And as the plant grows, we see this store getting less and less in the shriveling cotyledons. This shows that the young plant uses up this food in the course of its growth. But you must not forget that although we find the young plants provided with food in this way, we have not yet settled the question of the food supply for all plants. As we see, the cotyledons shrivel up and are emptied of their store long before the plant is full grown. Remember that baby calves have milk for food while old cows have grass. And when the store of food supplied in the seed is finished, the older plants must find new supplies for themselves. In growing seedlings, you must always keep them well supplied with water, the soil or sawdust in which they grow must be kept moist. If you take one out of the sawdust and try to grow it only in the air, you will find that it soon dies. Even for the seedling, the storehouse of food is not enough. It requires to have water too. You can keep seedlings growing quite well if you place them in glass jars so that the roots are in the water.